Thank you. So I'm a clinical psychologist and a services researcher, um, but I spend a lot of my time uh, co-directing a state center of excellence focused on the uptake of uh, evidence-informed practices in Washington state. And uh, I'm going to really be talking a lot from our experiences doing that and learning from others who are doing that in other states. In general, uh, my work focuses on three things in three areas. First, schools and school mental health, because that's where the kids are. It's where 70 percent of all services are delivered in behavioral health. Uh, second, care coordination. Uh, Kelly touched on this, and integrated care models for kids with the most complex needs, because that's where the money is. And so I'll probably be able to skip a couple of those points. But I, I think that that's a crucial area for us to be working on, is diverting those dollars to uh, upstream efforts in early intervention and prevention. And then third, state level policy and quality improvement efforts. Um, because uh, to, to our mind, uh, states, are the states, states are the place, right, where um, decisions are made. Kelly referred to this at the end about the governor's initiative to try to uh, find innovative funding mechanisms. It's the place where resource decisions are made, where state plans are developed for Medicaid, um, and where advocates, researchers, and uh, system partners can come together to ask the question, how can we apply evidence uh, to uh, improve the public health? or the health of our, of our kids. So we know what our ideal systems look like on paper. We have this uh, range of uh, interventions across intensiveness. Uh, we have a, a range of research-based pro programming across developmental phases of kids. Um, and we have, we're addressing the full pyramid of need uh, from uh, supportive um, health promotion and prevention efforts for the 80 percent, selected interventions at the 15 percent, and indeed inter intensive interventions and care coordinations for the kids who are most costly and the, with the most serious and complex needs. So the question is, when you're trying to build these systems at a state level or at any level, why does it so often feel like this? Um, there's a, a number of barriers to uptake of um, effective practices in the real world systems. Again, Kelly really hit on one of them, which is the imbalanced resource allocation that we're currently dealing with in our systems. But there is also this question of what are the right models for applying um, research evidence? How do we uh, ensure that we have a more empirical orientation to all of the aspects of system building, not just implementation of individual evidence-based practices, but policies and strategies at multiple levels to ensure that they're taken up in the right ways for the right kids? Um, so I'm going to hit on the first couple and then try and get to a few solutions that we've been trying to find. So we already know that mental health is the most costly health condition of childhood. Um, Kelly hit on this at the state level. I wonder how many folks have really seen these data from Sheila Pyres and the Center for Healthcare Strategies. They've crunched the numbers and they found that um, behavioral health services have an overall penetration rate of about 9% but they account for 38 percent of total Medicaid child expenditures, so 50 billion dollars of Medicaid health uh, spending for kids. Uh, 20 billion of them are going to behavioral health. And that is driven largely by residential treatment, therapeutic group homes, and other congregate care options. With, um, uh, they account for the, by far the largest percentage of total expenditures within behavioral health. Um, in Washington state, we learned uh, some years ago that if you took the 120,000 kids involved in all of our state public systems, the 4,000, 4,000 kids, you could almost, uh, with, with 40 counties in Washington State, you know, it's an average of 100 kids per county, you could almost know them by name. 4,000 kids with involvement in more than one system, child welfare, juvenile justice, mental health, um, accounted for 50 percent of all of our uh, mental health uh, spending in the state. Um, and what is it about these 4,000? If you're a kid with multi-system involvement in our state, 68 percent likelihood that you've spent a day out of home at least in the study year. If you only had involvement in one system, it's only 14 percent. So an in in inordinate amount of our resources going to these uh, complex needs kids. And our challenge is to flip these triangles from our current resource allocation to a needed resource allocation. And the tough part is diverting those dollars that you save downstream. But as we'll talk about in a little bit, we know that we can do this at a state level with real careful attention to how you're using medic potential Medicaid customizations, mechanisms like Kelly was, was talking about um, in accountable care organizations and so forth. So then the second barrier, and then we'll start talking about solutions, is this question that we're all preoccupied with, a lot of researchers in the room, a lot of folks who are promoting uh, the science to service uh, kind of pathway, which is the lack of empirical orientation to our systems. 
So our team is working with the NASHBID Research Institute to ask this question. After 10, 15 years of the evidence-based practice movement, how are we doing, right? Now, our, our data is limited somewhat. This is a state survey that's done uh, regularly by NASHBID Research Institute. I think Kimberly might have presented a little bit of a preview of this in, in one of your previous meetings. Um, but the results are somewhat discouraging. The three evidence-based practices that are actually tracked um, by NRI um, are, seem to be flatlining pretty quickly around 2007, uh, functional family therapy, MST. We know there's a lot more kid EPPs out there, um, and so this is a little bit artificial. But then if you take a look at the rates of adult EBPs, so you've got supported housing, supported employment, as well as uh, MST and FFT in here, we're talking about rates of penetration for kids with SED or adults with, MS, um, with SMI of like 1 or 2 percent. And it doesn't seem to be going in the right direction once you apply a denominator to these, right? Um, we also, from our data, it suggests that we're not really doing the right, some of the right things that might encourage uptake. So this is, uh, these are questions about what initiatives, if any, are you implementing to promote adoption of EBPs? And some of the things that seem like they might be most important, uh, riffing on what Kelly was talking about, which is follow the money. Um, specific budget requests, financial incentives to implement EBPs, they're going down. They're trending downwards, and they're not, they haven't gone up since the beginning of the last decade. So we're concerned about this, and we need to, we need to address that as, as a barrier. Um, I really wanted to uh, reference David Chambers' uh, dynamic sustainability framework, but I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. But I think one other thing that we need to recognize is we need to overcome some of our potentially outdated concepts about implementation frameworks that are only geared at scaling up one EBP in a system, when we know that you're probably going to need multiple EBPs, as Kelly was showing, to cover all the needs of a population. Another thing that we're really preoccupied with as you're building state systems is the is issue of reach. We need to be focusing on um, metrics of reach as opposed to effect sizes. This is uh, studied by our friend uh, Doug Zatzik back at University of Washington who was able to find that um, a universal and less costly intervention for individuals with PTSD like stepped collaborative care, um, even though it had an effect size of only 10 percent, was able to uh, prevent theoretically 10 times more cases of PTSD than a more specified kind of gold standard cognitive behavioral treatment that had an effect size of 50 percent because of all the barriers to uptake, the cost, the exclusion criteria. So again, another outdated thing that we should be kind of thinking about is how to replace effect sizes as the metric that we're looking for in our, in our programs with capacity to reach as many individuals as possible. Okay, so let's not admire the problems for the entire 15 minutes I have. Let's talk about some solutions. Um, I got to figure out where I'm at in my notes here. I'm really afraid of this light starting to flash on me. That would frighten me terribly. Um, okay, so over reliance on congregate care can and is being addressed through existing Medicaid options and application of research on intensive care coordination models and multimodal EBPs. In the last five or six years, um, there's been this uh, documentation of ways in which people are using these Medicaid customizations in states like Georgia, New Jersey, and Maine to reduce by 30, 40, 50 percent uh, residential and psychiatric inpatient uh, expenditures. And some of these states are actually then using those dollars and investing them upstream in prevention and early intervention. That's the key. Can't go to roads. It's got to go back into the system for more preventive uh, kinds of interventions. Um, we need to find ways to encourage states to maximize the options available to them in Medicaid. Um, it could be that social investment bonds are another mechanism around the private dollars that are needed to fill gaps. Um, but we need to invest in these things and send the savings up, upstream. So cover a more broad array of behavioral health, home, and community-based services. Cover evidence-based practices. Incorporate intensive care coordination using uh, models such as the wraparound approach. Um, the second thing that I think we need to recognize is harnessing the power of common elements and factors of evidence-based uh, treatment to try to improve real-world systems. So when we see that research shows that the efficacy of evidence-based treatments may be due to confounds in usual care comparison groups, okay, we need to flip these kinds of uh, findings on their head and say, well, if these are the things that actually close the gap between usual care and evidence-based treatments in, in, in trials, maybe what we should really be taking from that is not we've got a problem with the research, but these are the things we should be doing in usual care, right? Lowering caseloads, treating to target, measuring progress, focusing on high-quality supervision regardless of what the model is, 
Uh, make sure you're tr uh, providing effective specialized training. And of course, providing treatment based on evidence. How do you ensure that that evidence gets actually taken up in real world public systems? Um, in our state, we're really asking the question, how do you infuse the common elements and factors like that list that I was just showing you into real world systems that are going to affect the outcomes that are important to those systems? Um, so child well-being, permanency, um, and uh, prevention placement in child welfare, academic progress in schools. Um, juvenile justice, an example. In our state, juvenile justice developed an integrated treatment model that applies specific relevant types of evidence to residential care, parole, um, and so forth. So the way in which they've infused what we know about what works in research into their actual real world uh, treatment settings. Um, dialectical behavior therapy and mindfulness emphasized in residential settings where crises can set off um, all sorts of um, bad outcomes for the kids who are in those settings. Even more interestingly, um, parole staff began implementing a version of functional family therapy called functional family parole in which counselors worked to engage and motivate all family members, not just the identified uh, child. Um, and research, so uh, integrating these things directly into uh, parole and par training parole officers to uh, use a, an FF, uh, FFT based model. And what did the results find? Well, in fact, um, 12 months uh, later, uh, the youth who did not get functional family parole were 48% more likely to get arrested and 55% less likely to be employed. How were we able to do this propensity score matched uh, comparison trial? Because with the fiscal crisis in the late 2000s, functional family parole was cut. We were able to find a whole bunch of kids who looked similar to those who received it and document that uh, integrating evidence in this way made a huge difference in the lives of these kids. Um, it has not been reinstated. Um, similarly, um, meta-analyses are our friend in this day and age of improving systems. We're finding this over and over again, once again in juvenile justice. Mark Lipsy and his team have applied meta-analysis of characteristics of programs that reduce recidivism uh, to development of a scorecard for probation and other kinds of juvenile justice programs. So, you know, the meta-analysis asks, well, what are the effect sizes in terms of percent recidivism, um, not for evidence-based programs, but for different kinds of uh, programming? So discipline and deterrence, negative effects, uh, or, or I should say, um, actually increasing uh, recidivism. Surveillance, restorative skill building, counseling types of techniques and, and uh, services um, having a positive effect. So they applied these kinds of um, reviews of the data and the research to a scorecard that scored any kind of program on how they uh, stack up against these things that were found to have positive effects on recidivism. And what they found was is that um, when you uh, scored the programs and applied it to an entire state worth of programs, 66 programs in Arizona, um, first of all, the majority of programs didn't do very well. 73% had a score of less than uh, 50 on their, on their uh, scorecard. Oops. Um, so, and then what they found was is that those that scored above 50 um, showed uh, much greater recidivism than those that, sh that uh, scored below 50. So the point here is, uh, so we're applying this idea of, of infusing common elements and factors of, of evidence-based practice into real-world systems in schools, and I wanted to make sure we uh, talked about really quickly, we're doing this with a brief intervention uh, for school clinicians in the school context. I don't have time to go into. We're even applying Bruce Chorpita's managing and adapting practice uh, resources to wrap around care coordination to try to elevate the uh, quality and e effectiveness of clinical care that's received in what has primarily been considered a care coordination model, not a clinical model. And what we're finding is, is that resources that Bruce's team has developed to try to mobilize evidence in real world settings, like their uh, web-based, um, evidence-based services, uh, searchable database, the practitioner guides, are almost rated almost as highly uh, use, as, as useful by um, care coordinators as therapists. Um, I've got maybe 30 seconds here. So the last thing I want to talk about is something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is state centers of excellence. So how do you actually get all of these ideas mobilized with coalitions of people that include families and youth, advocates, researchers, system partners? Um, the example I'll speak to really quick, and maybe this will uh, set Brian up um, with, with, some, with uh, a little bit of um, what your appetite around child welfare. 
Uh, like I said, these public systems like child welfare, juvenile justice, are very amenable to our mind to the uptake and use of behavioral health EBPs if they're focused on the outcomes that are important to those systems. Um, so we have been working for some time with Children's Administration to implement a suite of behavioral health EBPs um, that are specific to the child welfare mission. Um, behavioral health EBPs like Incredible Years, PCIT, but also more traditional uh, child welfare preventive um, interventions such as safe care and, and home builders. And we were able to come up with um, a theory for the partnership, the, the Children's Administration UW Evidence-Based Practice Partnership uh, based on the model by Proctor et al. that shows that actually is the guide for our collective work recognizing that it's not just the evidence-based program models, but the implement st implementation strategies that you need at a state level. System strategies, organizational strategies like provider organizations, and individual practitioner strategies. And it's by mobilizing some of the, all of these things along with the program models that you're going to get to the outcomes you're trying to get to at the system, implementation, and child, youth, and family level. So just real quick examples, and then I'll, I'll, I'll close, because uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, we referenced what we think is such, a, such an important thing, which is trying to find ways to build these coalitions in states to improve public systems. Um, we've devi developed things with Ch Children's Administration like a web-based guidance tool for social workers to pick the right EBP based on the characteristics of the kid that they're working with, um, a structured readiness assessment so that they can choose providers carefully before they uh, contract with them to implement an EBP. Um, and uh, enhancements to the existing suite of EBPs, like cross-EBP motivational enhancement training. Um, bottom line, we, we, we've even tried to crack the nut of what do you do about fidelity monitoring when you're trying to implement not one EBP, but eight in a state system. This is not easy, but we figured out that you can boil it down to three different categories that provides a consistent basis of reporting to the providers and to the Children's Administration. The adequacy of the number of cases the providers have received, compliance with the rules, and competence that preserves the uh, specifications of each uh, evidence-based practice model. Bottom line is, is that um, across all of the regions of the state, in terms of utilization of um, expenditures for in-home contracted services, we've seen increases in the use of those EBPs against um, other kinds of models. Um, so I'll close now, and I've gone way over and I apologize. Um, but one of the things that I think would be really important would be to try and figure out, we have a lot of N of 1 experiments out there in terms of uh, state centers of excellence and mechanisms that states are using to try to increase the application of research evidence to improving public systems and get to uh, reach for all kids who would benefit from these kinds of programming. Um, and I think the question would be, how could we invest some resource and effort in learning um, which of those strategies of uptake um, are, are proving most effective? And I would be very happy to embark upon that with folks in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Brian, you ready to close panel one out? I am. And after Brian uh, presents, we will take questions.